Somewhere at some point in time, we fell in love. I really don't know when. Like all relationships, it seemed to happen in the blink of an eye, from the blur of whatever we were doing before to a passionate, unquestioning love for the modern, handsome, beautiful interface of the moment, apps. Maybe it was these gently whispered sweet nothings from all the way back in 2009. What's great about the iPhone is that if you want to check snow conditions on the mountain, there's an app for that. The commercial continued, our pulses quickened. And if you want to check exactly where you parked the car, don't tease me. We all know how to end that phrase. Six beautiful trademark words that may have unintentionally fenced in this generation's limitations on technological creativity. There's an app for that. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is 99 cents to download. An app, just by being an app, doesn't guarantee that it produces anything of merit to anyone or anywhere. Please, shh, we must defend our loved one's honor. An app's creation is told of gospel, of wonder, and of miracle. We're blessed that someone wrote working code that somehow illuminated the dark, mythical, mythical path to Apple or Google's app catalog. The New York Times featured an app of the week and had a recurring app smart extra column with heart, with heart throbbing titles like a weather app that works. And during the financial crisis, the New York Times featured a Bloomberg app as app of the week because it revealed, quote, basic stock market data. Or maybe you're thinking, oh, I'll just turn on Talking Heads CNN and forget about my app Muse. Think again, my friend. Here are real CNN headlines. Stuck in snow? There's an app for that. Remote sex? There's an app for that. No TP? There's an app for that. Can't sleep? There's an app for that. Passover? There's an app for that. Heart attack? There's an app for that. Save the whales? There's an app for that. Giving birth? There's an app for that. Dead? There's an app for that. I want to start off the lecture portion by looking at a picture of a toaster. I think looking at these everyday objects is kind of fascinating because it's revealing of what's on our culture's minds. This is a toaster from the late 1940s. At the time, we were obsessed with aerodynamic forms, things like fast-moving trains and planes and cruise ships. So we made an aerodynamic toaster. We love things like streamlined trains that are fast-moving. So we made fast-moving streamlined irons. Today, we're obsessed with gadgets, with laptops and smartphones and smartwatches, even fail technology like 3D television. So we do things like make this. This is Crest 3D Whitening. It's the number one selling toothpaste in the United States. And unlike all the other toothpaste on the market, this one is 3D. <laughs> this is one of the top selling sunglasses on Amazon. This is how a mattress company today advertises for a mattress. Not with a picture of a mattress, but with a woman sleeping on top of a fully charged battery icon. Doritos doesn't make potato chips, they 3D print them. These everyday objects are reflections of how technology is taking over our lives. If you want a little more empirical data about where we're headed, one of the interesting things to look at is what young people are choosing to study. And more and more people are choosing to study things related to technology. You're seeing in art schools across the world an interest in more and more interaction design programs. There's all this excitement, all this momentum, all this talent that's here in this room and all this talent that's coming. But so often we set a low bar, we do something unfortunate. Because no matter what the problem, we so often have the same answer. Question, how do you make a better car? Above is one of the earliest patent drawings from an automobile. The technologists of the day solved the real problem of transportation. And as a result, the car changed the way we live. So today, utilizing the amazing technological progress we've made in the over 100 years since, what technique have modern technologists used to improve the car? Answer, slap an interface on it. 
Who would need to look at the road while driving? <laughs> Leaning over to touch a screen is so much more fun. Tesla is one of the most innovative companies in the world. That's why they've got a 17-inch touchscreen center console. Sure, there's some haters. Some lost soul at The Verge wrote, I don't want a web browser in my car. More importantly, I don't want the drivers around me to have one. But consider scroll bars in your center console. I know, amazing. Question, how do you make a better trash can? Answer, slap an interface on it. You can make a better trash can by turning it into a $47,000 LCD recycling bin so you can see if it's raining outside when you're standing outside in the rain. <laughs> 100 of these incredible bins were installed in London just before the 2012 Olympic Games to help the city show off its futuristic wonders. And why not? Screens are so futuristic. This is a set of job listings with some of the top technology companies. You'll see something unusual about these job listings. They advertise for these UX slash UI designers. But of course, UX, user experience design, and UI, UI design, user interface design, are very different things. UI design is about all those components that go on a screen. It's an important job. But it's very different than UX design. UX design is about talking to people, understanding customers, about solving those overall problems and identifying them. But when you confuse the two, when you confuse solving problems with making screens, you make it someone's job to solve problems with screens. But good experience design, good UX, isn't a set of good screens. It's a good experience. There's a lot of confusion today about design and technology. Part of it is because we're evaluated by all these poor metrics. Designers are good or bad depending on how many clicks they can generate, how addicted they can get someone, how hooked they can get someone to a particular service. That's not what design is about. Design about elegance and efficiency. If I designed a spoon that took you 12 hours to eat a bowl of soup, that wouldn't be a good designed spoon. Our output as a result has become more and more screen time for more and more people. In the United States, children look at a screen for two hours a day. Teenagers who are mostly in school look for, at screens for over seven hours a day. Adults, we stare into the light over eight hours a day. And of course, there's consequences to all this screen-based thinking, all these screens that we're creating. People are constantly distracted from friends and family. The CDC, the Center of Disease Control in the US, estimates that 1,000 people every day get injured in a car accident because they're distracted by screens while driving a car. The color temperature of our screens mimics midday. It does that to produce these deep blacks and bright whites. But when we look at that color temperature at night, it's scientifically proven to throw off our sleep cycle. It makes our bodies think that it's midday. Earlier this year, WNYC, public radio station in New York City, had a series called Bored and Brilliant. It was about how studies show moments of boredom. Those moments when you're in the shower, on the train, on the bus, or when you have your most creative moments, most creative thoughts. With all these startups and big companies trying to solve for micro-boredom, we're less and less bored, and we're less and less creative as a world. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are good things about screens. These slides wouldn't exist if it wasn't for screens. You may not be here today if it wasn't for the information delivered to you through screens to be here today. But I think we can greatly reduce the amount of screen time that's necessary. It wasn't that long ago that our lives were filled with paper, and there were some people that dreamed of a paperless world. Now, instead, our lives are filled with screens, and I think we should dream of a screenless world. I actually think that the best graphical user interface is no interface. So I wrote this book about it. It's called The Best Interface is No Interface. It talks about how and why we can get there. The first principle of the book is to embrace typical processes instead of screens. This is uh, some video footage of Dr. Michael Rothberg. A number of years ago, he experienced something that was undocumented in the, in the medical field, a psychological experience. He was curious if anybody else had had that same experience happen to them, so with, along with another doctor, he designed a survey for the medical staff in the hospital in which he worked. They found that an astounding 68% of medical staff had had that same undocumented experience happen to them. They published the results in a medical journal, and a year later, the study was repeated to undergraduate college students. This time they found that 90% of people had had that same psychological experience happen to them. So what was it that plagued Dr. Rothberg and plagued so many of us? Something called ringsiety, or phantom vibration syndrome. 
The idea that your phone is buzzing and beeping when it's not. It's not surprising, Kleiner Perkins, a venture capitalist firm, found a few years ago that the average smartphone user gets 150 notifications per day. Earlier this year, a study in the UK showed that people check their phones over 200 times a day. It's all these services, all these addictive services, all this poor measurement of design where you're buzzing and beeping your pocket, screaming, let me out, take me out, use me. I think there's a different way, there's a different way of creating great technology. A number of years ago, the Moves app launched. There's something really interesting about the original app icon. Not visually, but conceptually. It shows a phone in a pocket. It says, I like to live in your pocket. I'm a sort of back pocket app. This is where I belong. And what the Moves app did is it tracked, you know, sort of digital pedometer. It tracked the number of steps and where you went. But unfortunately, to get any, really va any real value out of the Moves app, you had to look at this data dashboard, which no one ever really wants to do. Here's a different problem, losing your house keys. Happens to a lot of people. Startup tried to solve it by launching an app for that. It's called Lockatron. And this giant unlock and lock button, OK, UI cover that goes over the deadbolt, and when you press the lock or unlock button, it shifts the deadbolt. Lockatron then backed down. They said, well, what about our user experience? What does this really look like for our end customer? It's kind of what it looks like. So first, you have someone who walks up to their door, and they want to open it. Next, they want to open their door, so they pull their phone out of their pocket. Three, they want to open their door, so they hit the power button to wake up their phone. Four, with the current version of iOS, they want to open their door, so they slide to unlock. Five, they want to open their door, so they enter a pin code. Six, they want to open their door, so they hit the home button to exit their last opened app. Seven, they want to open their, their door, so they hit the home button to exit their last opened group. Eight, they want to open their door, so they swipe through a sea of icons to try to find the Lockatron app. Nine, they want to open their door, so they hit the app icon to launch Lockatron. Ten, they want to open their door, so they just wait for the Lockatron app to load. Eleven, they want to open their door, so they hit this giant unlock button. Twelve, they want to open their door, so they open their door. <laughs> they looked at this and they thought, well, something's really wrong here. Something's wrong about our user experience. And they had heard about this idea of the best interfaces, no interface, and they wondered, what if we can really embrace our typical processes instead of screens? What if we just got rid of all those steps that have to do with an interface? Is this possible? Could we actually make it more seamless? And when they looked at it this way, they thought, oh, if we just put a Bluetooth radio into our deadbolt and one that talks from our app to that deadbolt when it's close to the door, we can have people just walk up to their door and open it. It's a back pocket app. It delights their customers while, the, while your phone just sits in your pocket. Other companies have experimented with this kind of thing, this kind of idea from going from screen-based thinking, what we've been doing for the last two decades, to screen list thinking, which is embracing modern computing. When Logatron showed that video on Kickstarter, they generated over $2 million. That's really good for a door lock. As I mentioned, other companies have been playing around with it. Square has this auto-tab feature they're experimenting with. When you walked up to a restaurant or your cafe that you had the auto-tab feature turned on to, your name popped up on the cash register behind. And when you walked up to the, the register, the person behind it could just tap to confirm your payment. You could pay without taking your phone ever out of your pocket. It was a payment solution that uses a back pocket app. There's a startup called Ginger.io that developed a number of medical solutions. One of their products is a back pocket app. It's for people with severe depression. It looks at certain triggers, like when did you wake up? When did you leave the house? Are you calling your friends and family? It looks at those triggers instead of buzzing and beeping in your pocket, asking you how you're feeling from 1 through 10, looking for drop downs and form fields. Instead of that inaccurate information, they found accurate information about depression, and they found a better app, a better use case, by keeping your phone in your pocket. Born with the ability to access its own exact location anywhere in the world, created with the innate thinking process, provide more timely and richer knowledge than an entire public li library in a millisecond, formed to be, remember a generation of enlightenment, computing devices have largely and sadly turned into this, like us at our worst 
the terrible twos. A state of life where an emotional wreck struggling with rules and responding to unexpectedness with simple variations of a single word expressed through a limited vocabulary. No, no, no. No, your username is not valid. No, Chase Bank Online requires numbers in your name. No, your name is not unique enough for Gmail. Pick another name. No, you can't leave us, you can't leave that blank. You need to give us your title, doctor, mister, or missus. It is mandatory at the London Heathrow Airport to connect to Wi-Fi. No, your password is not strong enough. No, it's not long enough. No, it needs an uppercase letter. No, it needs a punctuation mark. No, not that one. <laughs> no, you cannot use one of your last 20 previous passwords on JetBlue. No, dates have to be MMDDYYYY at the New York Times Online Archive, not MMDDYY. No, I don't care if it'll be another 100 years until that matters again. No, these fields are required. Do it now or I will turn red with rage. <laughs> that chapter is talking about the second principle of the book, which is to leverage computers instead of serving them. If you go to the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., you'll see some of our greatest collections. Dinosaur bones we've collected. Things like this supercomputer. This is IBM's Deep Blue. This supercomputer is famous, of course, because in 1997, it beat Garry Kasparov at a game of chess. We knew computers could outthink us and outcalculate us, but to outthink us strategically, that was something new. The algorithms and the incredible processing power of Deep Blue helped the machine beat Kasparov. But if you compare Deep Blue's processing power that computer, that supercomputer from 97, to the computers we hate, to the computers we dread today. We want to kind of smash up and maybe even throw out the window. <laughs> Compared to these computers, Deep Blue's processing power is actually pathetic. These computers have processors that are far better than what Deep Blue, what this incredible machine that sits in the Smithsonian could do. But we create these systems, these arcane systems, that are the same that we built in 1978 where we serve computers. Instead, by embracing sensors and radio and other kinds of contemporary computing technology, we can create computer systems that serve us. Today, there's a new kind of chore, a new set of numerous mindless errands embedded into our already overwhelmingly busy lives. Over the past decade, these tiny requests have been culminating to a larger and larger ball of more and more of our time, taking us farther and farther away from spending more time, more time with our friends and family or allowing us a free time to make our community stronger by volunteering. These tasks are the result of graphical user interfaces that assume the constant demanding attention as the expected norm. They're the byproduct of screen-based thinking, first-world errands for the almighty computer and their parent productivity software we have to manage. From their roots and delight and harmlessness, you've got mail. They've grown into an endless stream of to-dos and checklists. As our lives continue to become increasingly digital, these tasks have exponentially increased because of standard paradigm in making new software is that we serve the computer, that we live to click. As each old world thing turns digital, the software has more and more requests for you. On a given day, you could have software updates to download and install, passwords to reset, notifications to attend to, files and folders to sort, messages to archive, social media requests to confirm, calendars to update, credit card balances to check, information to verify, storage space to monitor, monitor documents to back up, messages to reply to, photos to upload, flights to check in. These are digital chores, the maintenance of our digital lives. Oh, a new version of the operating system is available? Yes, I'd love to download it for the next few hours. These digital chores are nightly, weekly, and monthly errands that can sometimes feel just as mundane and forced as taking out the trash. Sometimes they have even worse consequences than traditional chores. Previously, you forgot to do the laundry and you had to wear an old shirt. Now you forget to accept a request and your friend may not be a friend anymore. You forget to change your password, your account can get hacked, and you can lose all your private pictures. Or maybe even all your friends all get porn in their inboxes attributed to you. No, I swear that's not my dick pic. There are some people who are chipping away these digital chores, who are actually creating products and services that try to reduce the amount of time we spend with software. You know, there's If This Then That, which has these sort of hacker-based recipes. There's services like Unroll Me, which try to reduce the amount of time that you spend on email. There's a startup called X.AI, which tries to schedule your calendar appointments for you. 
There's some people who are taking it to the third principle of the book. Startups this year that I'm seeing emerge that follow some of these principles, that create that system that adapts for individuals. Here's a problem, saving money. A lot of us are really terrible at it. Most Americans don't save, past, don't save 30 days of their income worth. So a startup called Digit plugs into your checking account. It looks at how you spend your money. And over time, it gets more and more confident about moving some of your checking account money to your savings account. You just set it up once and it just works in the background. It doesn't ask you every day. It doesn't ask you to set goals. There's no real tapping and touching. In fact, they don't even have an app. It's just a service that makes your life better by embracing what a computer does best. I'm going to finish this lecture by reading from the last chapter of the book. One day, I hope you think this book is utterly boring, passe, and that you hear about the idea of screenless solutions and yawn. Because if that day comes, remember to celebrate. You'll be living in a better time, not one drowning in screens with intentionally addictive interfaces that distract us from one another, but one in which typical processes are embraced. When computers serve us instead of us serving them, when technological, technological systems are continuously adapting to our individual needs. A day, probably a few decades from now, when children dress up on, as their grandparents on Halloween by sticking smartphones to their faces. Look, I'm like grandpa, so there's this giant phone all day. That day will be joyous. I hope that today's marvel becomes tomorrow's mundane, that no UI is like watching a rerun of Friends. But that day may not come. This book is a journey into just one possible future. Some of the companies I've mentioned take us, taking us toward that future may have disappeared by the time you've read this book. If there's enough dust in the cover of your copy, some of the examples may, in this text may feel ancient. I hope the ideas in this book aren't forgotten, but end up as stepping stones to something far greater, a future in which the best case of a graphical user interface has been understood as no interface. Along the way, there'll be battles to be fought inside companies and classrooms, privacy issues to tackle, and other unforeseen hurdles. But when the philosophy is subtle, the debaters come to agreement, the doers understand how to get it done, and the business plans start to fall into place, we could have something utterly revolutionary in our hands. And when that revolution finally comes to fruition, we may think of it as the most boring, expected solution. No screens? Tell me something I don't know. Here's the hoping for that boredom. Thanks. I guess we have two, two minutes if anyone has any questions. Hi. <clears throat> uh, so how do you hire, hire a great UX guy and how do you know he's a great UX pro kind yeah. of guy? Well, it starts with understanding the customer. If this is somebody who just wants to show you angled shots of screens on a portfolio, that's probably not your user experience designer. It's going to be somebody who is looking and understanding their customers and trying to solve their problems and creating scenarios, customer journey maps. Those are the kinds of deliverables you're looking for in a great user experience designer. OK. Maybe we want one more? Yeah. There's a couple over here. <laughs> Hello. Uh, nice talk. Thank you. Uh, there is so many uh, startups outside who are uh, developing products, services with screens. What can you say to them? Um, well, I'll tell them that they're making the problem worse in many cases. <laughs> but you know, it depends on your approach, right? So say you're trying to do something to make it to make our experiences more elegant and efficient, and you're trying to reduce the amount of time, but you have to use a little bit of screen to, in order to communicate something to someone, that's fine, that's totally great, you're trying to progress this forward, but you're trying to create something that gets people off of their regular routines and gets them addicted to a particular thing, and you evaluate that product by looking at how many times they swipe through something, that's not a good metric, that's not a great metric for, like, for what we're trying to do, for what designers are supposed to be doing as makers of technology, and what we're kind of doing to the rest of the world. It's not a good thing, it's not a good outcome. We try to pretend that we're really idealistic and that we, we do all these great things for the world, but when we just distract them from the great things that matter, that's a problem. Yeah. Hi, um, very nice talk. By the way, are you, are you talking about the design thinking from the first? What, what, do, you, what do you mean by that? Am I just talking about design thinking? You mean just like as a general concept, design thinking? Uh, yeah, by Tim Brown. It's the, yeah. the fact that you made a product by the usage. Uh, yeah. And 
using the design to make it? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I mean, the, a big part of design thinking is understanding your customer. And under, like when I showed that Lockatron flow and showed someone going through something, a big part of, of great design thinking is observing people and understanding the context in which they use things. We so often just look at sets of wireframes and we just look at that on a wall or we look at screen, 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 and we don't look at the people involved. And if you do good and you exercise great design thinking, you're looking at the people and the customers involved in that particular scenario. I don't know where the microphone is. Okay, we're good. Thanks, guys.